ready to study the Word of God, yes or no? Okay, the second coming of Christ. How many knows Jesus is coming back? He is. In fact, I'm going to say it this way, based upon what we talked about last week, is Jesus coming again? And the answer is absolutely, absolutely, he is coming back. And I, I want to set up the stage for what we're going to talk about today, in that we're going to talk about the book of Revelation. In fact, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to take you from Revelation 1 all the way to Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to take you through the entire book of Revelation in about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to come back and focus on what Jesus said to the, to the churches, the seven churches, that, that he, he uh, gives this revelation to John. So I'm going to set the foundation of what we're going to talk about today. And before I get to that, I want to remind you, you know, based again what we talked about last Sunday, that there are different viewpoints concerning the end times, specifically when Jesus is coming back again. Uh, if you know your Bible, you study your Bible, you'll, you'll, or if you just grew up in church, you would hear it this way. Some people believe that Jesus is coming again at the beginning of the tribulation. Some people say in the middle of the tribulation. And then a few people, not, uh, not nearly as many, believe he's coming back at the end of the tribulation. And, and uh, wherever you stand on that, I, I just want you to know, wherever you stand on that, I'm okay. I'm, like, I'm okay. Meaning we don't always have to have the same opinion to still be in unity, as long as we all agree that Jesus is the Savior of the world, and the only way to get to God, the only way to get to, to heaven is through Jesus Christ, by putting your, your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, that's how you make it to heaven. Can I get an amen to that, somebody? Okay, so that being said, I'm going to give you today the, the, the general... Uh, the generally accepted timeline throughout the Bible. So, so what most theologians believe, and I'm talking the vast majority of them believe this timeline that I'm gonna teach you today. And again, if you have little disagreements in there, it's okay. That, that, doesn't, mean, uh, that doesn't mean we're not in unity. So uh, if you think that the, the, the rapture of the church is at the front of the tribulation or in the middle of it or at the end of it, can I just tell you of my heart, everybody? I just, like I said last week, I just want to go up on the first elevator. That's all I want. You know what I'm saying? So whenever that happens, I just want to be on the first elevator up. That's all I got to say. And, and when it happens, God knows that. God knows that. And, and again, it's certainly nothing to cause disunity in a, in a church about. It just, it just isn't. And at the same point, today I'll be teaching you just generally accepted theology concerning the end times. And if you would like to go deeper in your study of the end times, if you would say, Pastor Justin, who do you recommend? It's so interesting that this past um, Thursday, uh, my wife and I got together with Pastor Tony and Sherry uh, Mercer, and we just get together with them every now and then, have dinner, and, and just... Uh, we, we're just friends with them. So the, the rule is that we don't talk church, we don't talk leadership, we, don't, we, just, we, we just are friends and we just hang out. Well, he was asking me though, um, hey, uh, you know, what are you teaching on? And I said, well, hey, I'm, I'm about to go into the, the end times and we can talk Bible, we just can't talk work if that makes any sense. He said, you know what? The, the person I love the most about, about uh, our teachings on the end time is Dr. David Jeremiah. And actually when he said that, I, I told him, that's so interesting, he's my favorite too. Like, uh, both Pastor Tony and I, we love to, if we're going to hear somebody else teach about the end times, we just love Dr. David Jeremiah is his name. And uh, he, has, he has a website devoted to it. I would highly encourage you to go there. And if, if you want to study this in depth, today is just going to be, I'm, I'm talking an overview of the timeline. If, if we broke down every single aspect of it, we would be teaching this. I would be teaching this for the next seven years, you know, that type of thing. It, it would just be forever. So I'm going to give you a, a synopsis, just an overview of the entirety of, of the timeline. But before we get there, uh, I want to uh, start with... Um, what Jesus says to John the Revelation, and give, uh, John the Revelator, and give you a little bit background of the book of Revelation. So John uh, is a disciple of Christ, followed Christ, and really uh, tradition has it that he was the only disciple that was not martyred for the cause of Christ, but he was certainly persecuted. And at the writing of the book of Revelation, he's actually in, uh, he, he's on the isle, what we would call the Isle of Patmos. He's on this island. It's under Roman control. And he's, he's been exiled, so he's, he's being persecuted. But on this island, if you study the Isle of Patmos in, this, in, this, in, in that generation, it, you could think of it as one big rock quarry, and, and there was no escaping it. After all, you were on an island, so there was some level of freedom that the prisoners would have on this island. And again, he's being persecuted because of Jesus Christ, but... but um, 
most theologians agree that he must have had friends, he must have had companions of sorts that would come and bring him things. Uh, and we do know this, this is historical fact that, that people would come and they would bring food, they would bring items uh, to their loved ones, to other prisoners on the Isle of Patmos. They would bring those things and no doubt people brought things to John because when Jesus goes to John, he shows up and he says, John, I want you to write this down. Well, somebody at some point must have given him some, some ink and paper. They, they must have done that because he wrote down what Jesus revealed to him. Okay, so Jesus shows up in Revelation chapter one and he gives this revelation to the disciple John and John is, uh, is taken aback to say the least. In fact, let's read this Revelation chapter one starting in verse 10. It says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. And now we're gonna come back to this at the end of the message, so I'm not gonna read that right now. We're gonna come back to it. Verse 12, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me and when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white, as, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing like fire. His feet like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance, and we are not left to our imagination as to who this is. Because in verse 17, it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Watch this, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Can I get an amen to that somebody? It was Jesus Christ himself shows up uh, to John in his glorified body and John did the very thing that you and I would have done too. He passed out. He literally, he fell like dead. He, he just passed out. And, and Jesus reaches down with his right hand and says, it's okay, John, come on up, buddy. Come on up. I know, this is, I know this is taking you off guard, but I got some things to tell you. And he begins to explain uh, what he wants John to say, not only to the churches in, in Minor Asia, or these, these seven churches, he tells John what he wants to say actually to you and me, and I'll prove that to you in a second, as well as John gets this, this vision, this revelation of the end times. And it's an amazing revelation, and we're still reading about it today. And I thought today it would be great if I just gave you an overview of the timeline, of what's generally accepted as the timeline according to the word of God, and um, and, and then I'll break it down and where it is chapter by chapter in the book of Revelation. That way, if you wanna study it on your own, and I would encourage you to do so, it, it might be a little bit easier for you. So I put what I, on the screen right now, I also put that on your sermon notes, but here's a graph, a diagram that I came up with um, to, to explain the end times, and it's gonna stay up there for a little while, and it's, it matches what's in your sermon notes. So of course, you see on the left-hand side, not only the cross of Jesus, but it says chapter, Revelation 2 and 3, chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation is the church age, the church age. Let's break that down right now. Jesus, in Revelation 1, he tells John, John, I got something to say, and I want you to write this down, and I want you to get this word out, this letter, to the seven churches that I'm going to tell you about. And John does it. He takes this note, and then chapter 2 and 3, he's, he's actually writing what Jesus wants him to say to these seven churches. And if you say, Pastor Justin, where are we on this timeline? I wanna tell you up front, we are currently in Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three. Meaning, meaning this, all theologians, uh, we, we all agree that this is, we are living in the church age, the church age. We are living in this age of grace where anybody who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're gonna be saved that they're gonna be saved from their sin and the penalty of their sins. And because of Jesus Christ, we get to gather together just like we are today. We get to worship him. We get to talk about him. We get to celebrate him. We get to be changed by him. And we get to do that in unity. So right now, if you say, where are we in this timeline? You are living in Revelation chapter two and chapter three. We are in the, the, the church age, the church age. Age, you're living in it right now. Can I tell you something else? That all, all of the biblical prophecies 
up to Revelation chapter three, all of those Bible prophecies have not only been fulfilled, but have been incredibly accurately, all of them fulfilled to this point, giving us evidence that what, what prophecies have not been fulfilled, and that would be Revelation chapter four through, verse, or through chapter 22, will too be fulfilled in, in the right time, at the right time. Only God knows when that's gonna happen. Can I tell you, every Bible prophecy is going to be accurately fulfilled I promise you, because so far, every one of them until the church age has. You say, what's keeping Jesus from coming back right now? I don't know. I, I, from what we, from what we th- those of us who really study the word of God, from what we understand, what we know, Jesus could come back right now because enough, all of those prophecies have been fulfilled. He could come back right now. So the return of Jesus Christ is imminent, meaning it's going to happen, and it could happen at any moment. And we don't live in fear. We just live with readiness. We, we live, we, we, what we said last week, we get ready, we keep watch, and then we live our lives to make a difference. We're always thinking about the return of Christ could happen at any moment. Now, most theologians believe that, it's going to, that the rapture of the church found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Also, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Uh, uh, um, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verse 52, he says that the, the, the taking away or the rapture of the church is gonna happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's just gonna, it's just gonna be, I mean, it's just gonna be so quick. It's just gonna happen. So we read about that in multiple places. Now, most theologians believe it happens at the beginning of the tribulation. Some believe it happens in the middle of the tribulation. The point of the fact, or the point of the matter is, it's just going to happen. We don't know exactly when. So, that being said, right after the, the coming of Christ or in the middle uh, of, of the tribulation when the rapture of the church could happen, some believe that, it, there is going to be a, a tribulation time of seven years. And the first seven years of the tribulation is going to be peace. It, it's, you, you, the Antichrist is gonna rise up with a false prophet and, and peace is going to be established in the world, and for three and a half years, it's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, uh, flowers and lollipops and, and rainbows. You know what I'm talking about? It's gonna, be, it's gonna be wonderful for the world, but then something's gonna happen. He's gonna set up an idol of himself in the temple, and he's gonna demand worship of that idol, and all, and I mean this literally, all hell is gonna break loose for the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Now, the, the tribulation is noted in Revelations chapter six through 19. So all of the chapters 6 through 19 in the, in the book of Revelation is talking about the tribulation. So if you want to look in depth at the tribulation, you certainly can. And I want to tell you, before, before we go too far, that as you read the, 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 the chapters 6 through 19, you're going to ask yourself some questions. You're going to say things like, is that literal? Like, these beasts are going to appear and they look like, what? How is that going to happen? And, and can I tell you, can I tell you something? I wouldn't get too hung up on those type of things because, think about this, if John has a picture of the future, but this is 2,000 years ago, he is seeing things in his mind's eye, the the Lord is revealing things to him that he has no way of expressing because possibly they haven't even been invented yet. For instance, if, you're, if, the, if this was 2,000 years ago and God gives you a, a picture of World War III involving, and I'm making this up, but involving helicopters, how are you gonna write that if the helicopter doesn't even exist? If it's 2,000 years ago and nobody can fly, but you're seeing these flying things, how do you write that down? Well, John gives his very best. He writes these things down. And so if you say, hey, are, the, are those literal? Are those figurative God knows. God knows. And one of these days, it's all going to come about. And I think at those times, we're going to say, oh, yeah, I get it now. Yeah, I see it now. Oh, he was obviously talking about this. He was obviously talking about that. But it's hard to write 2,000 years ago in, in detail what would happen later, you know, later on in the course of time. Okay, so the tribulation, chapters 6 through 19. At the end of the tribulation, it's going gonna, it's gonna to climax into what we call the Battle of Armageddon. And the Battle of Armageddon and, and the second coming of Christ are, are going to happen near the same time. 
The first rapture of the church is when Jesus comes back for his church. But at the second coming of Christ, Jesus is coming back not for his church, he's coming back with his church to rule and to reign throughout the millennium or the millennial reign of Christ or the millennium kingdom. He's gonna reign for a thousand years and during those thousand years, it's gonna be filled with peace. It's gonna be like a utopia, kind of like a Garden of Eden type of moment and uh, lives are going to be extended it's going to be a time of peace where Christ and his church will reign. Why is that? Because Satan, at the end of the tribulation, before the millennial reign of Christ or the millennium, Satan is going to be bound and he's going to be cast into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. And at the end of a thousand years, he's going to be released. And at the, as he's released, he's going to form an army. He's going to deceive many. And there's going to be another battle. And that battle is called the Battle of Gog and Magog. And you can read about that, everybody, at the end of Revelation uh, chapter 20. And, and, uh, and you'll also read about the great white throne judgment. It's all right there in Revelation 19, 20, uh, 21, of course, changes to the new heaven and the new earth. And that's how he finishes the book. So at the end of the millennial reign of Christ is going to be the great white throne judgment is what we call it. Because John sees... John sees God sitting on a great white throne. And at that point, the devil and demons and all the fallen angels and unrepented sinners are going to be cast into the lake of fire, into eternal hell, eternal separation from God. But all of those who place their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ, hopefully every single one of us, we are going to enjoy Revelation chapter 21 and 22, a new heaven and a new earth, and all the things that used to be will be no more, all the things that are here. That's why I tell you, this earth is just temporary. One of these days, there's gonna be a new earth. There's gonna be a new heaven, and it's gonna be wonderful, and then we get to be with Jesus forever and for always, and all things will have come to an end except eternity, meaning uh, those of us who love Jesus will be with him for all, forever. Those who, who refused Jesus, who rejected Jesus, they'll be eternally separated from him, and, and then it's eternity from, from then on out. And you say, well, that's a pretty overwhelming thought. You're exactly right. It's a very overwhelming thought. And one of the things that Jesus is telling John, he said, John, I, I have some things for you. I want you to write these things down. You're about, to, you're about to receive knowledge concerning the end times, and I want the church to be ready. I want the church to be ready. In fact, you're about to hear about the end times. You're about to reveal this to these churches, but I want you to tell them specific things. Can I tell you something about being a pastor? Um, thank you, I will. Um, <laughs> the Bible says that those of us who teach the word of God are going to be judged more strictly. And it's because, everybody, um, I, I have somewhat of the same calling that John has upon his life. I have it on my life that I have to prepare you for what is to come. Did you know that? That one of my jobs as a pastor is to prepare you in knowledge and understanding in the word of God. I have to prepare you for what's to come. It is your responsibility, however, to be prepared. It's my job to teach it to you, to help you prepare. Let me say it a different way but I cannot prepare for you. Your response to this is, as I often say, your response is your responsibility. So today, I am doing my job as, as a pastor and as a teacher. I am preparing you for what's to come. But it's your job to get ready, to keep watch, and to make a difference. It is your job to stay prepared for the end times. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so what would Jesus want us to know then in preparation for the end times? What does he want us to know? Well, he tells us through John in these letters to the seven churches. He says, this is how you be prepared for what is to come. And he breaks it down in Revelation chapter two, Revelation chapter three. Now, if I were to stop right here and say, okay, so far, who has a question? There would be 100 hands, whoa, whoa. What about the mark of the beast? And what about people getting their heads chopped off? And what, what about, you know, these beasts that are gonna, and what about, and what about, that? Hey, hey, listen, that's not the topic of the day. The topic of the day was just a timeline. If you want to dig deep, I would tell you, start a small group, 
get Dr. David Jeremiah's information. Somebody told me this morning that they, they think Max Licato just wrote about uh, in time soon. I love Max Licato's stuff. I don't know if you know who he is or not, but uh, there are trusted theologians and, and pastors out there that have a lot of information uh, for you to dive into. So, so do that. Start a small group and study it, or just start studying it in your house. A- after all, you have the same Bible that I have, right? It's just that what I've found out in life, that some people just study it more than others. And let's all be studiers of the Word of God, right? Can I get an amen to that, somebody? We got to study it. We have to know it. And it's right there for the taking. You can study it too, just like I do. Okay, so in preparation for the end times, I'm going to prepare you to the best of my ability by teaching you what Jesus taught these seven churches that were really in modern-day Turkey. And I'm going to break this down one by one. This is how to be ready for the end times. Number one, Jesus tells the church at Ephesus, he tells them, return to your first love. Return to your first love. That's what he tells them. I'm not gonna spend very much time in any of these. I'm I'm gonna skip through them pretty quickly here, so listen fast and take good notes. Revelation 2, 4, and 5, Jesus says this to to this church at, at Ephesus. He says, yet I hold this against you, You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. And you you would say, well, that doesn't sound very good. It doesn't, does it? But you say, well, what is that? What is is that? Hey, Hey, listen, you don't have to worry about that as long as you return to your first love. Let me ask you a question. For those of you, now, now not everybody has the story. When I, was, when I became a Christian, I was seven years old. I mean, I, there wasn't much to repent of when I was seven. You know what I'm talking about, y'all? Like, I, 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 I hadn't lived a lifetime of sin. I was only seven. Now, I had sinned, and I knew that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. I knew exactly what I was doing. But the truth of the matter is, some of you have come to Christ at a at a later time in your life, and when you came to Christ and surrendered your life to Christ, trusting in him alone for salvation, you were filled with this overwhelming joy and this peace and this love for God and this love for others, and you were skipping as you were leaving church that day or wherever you were. And Jesus said, what happened? I used to be first in your life. You used to have a life of joy and peace and hope, and you couldn't stop talking about me. Jesus would say, what's that? What happened? Return to your first love. Second thing, he tells John, I I want you to tell the church at Smyrna. Write this down, remain faithful. Remain faithful. And he gives us these words in Revelation 2.10. He says, don't be afraid about what... Uh, of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and, will, and you'll suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. He says, be faithful even to the point of death. You know what Jesus would want for, from you here in the end times, as we face the end times? You know what he wants? He wants, for you, to, he wants you to remain faithful. It says, no matter what happens, no matter, no matter what persecution I face, no, no matter what is happening in the world around me, I'm going to be faithful to God. I'm going to be faithful to Jesus. I'm going to be faithful to his word. I'm not going to buy into what the, the world has to offer. I'm not going to buy into the lies that they're speaking. I'm going to be true to God, true to his son, and true to his word. I'm going to remain faithful come hell or high water. I'm never going back again. And that needs to be our mindset, new song. Somebody came up to me uh, years ago and said, you know what, the per- like they, they had this vision, this dream, and they said, you know what, I really feel like in, in the near future, the church Christians are going to be persecuted in this nation like it's happening in other places. And they said, are you scared of that? I said, I, and, and in all reality, I said, no, actually I'm not. Because I have it settled in my heart. Now, first of all, I don't doubt that that could happen. But I've already settled it in my heart. No matter what comes, I will remain faithful. I'm all in. I'm not going back. I, I, I'm going to live out the word of God. And I'm going to hold to it 
even though it's politically incorrect sometimes, I'm going to hold to it. And not one person said amen to that. I'm waiting for you. It's not too late. Okay, there you go. There you go. Okay. Can, can I tell you, everybody, you will be, you will be tested in this. Are you going to remain faithful? And you need to set that in your heart. I'm going to remain faithful. Jesus said, hey, I want you to tell the church at Pergamum, number three, reject doctrinal extremes. And that, that probably doesn't mean much to you, but I'm going to, I'm going to break it down to you according to what Jesus says in verses 14 through 16. To the church of Pergamum, he says, nevertheless, I have these few things against you. There are some of you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, uh, you got to reject doctrinal extremes. Let me explain it to you. So uh, those who hold to the teaching of Balaam is like, it's those who say, listen, just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean you can't go still have fun. Just because you hold to the teaching of Jesus, hey, if it feels good, just do it because that's what grace is all about. Just because you believe in Jesus doesn't mean you don't, don't still get to live the life that you really want to live. So go ahead, embrace sexual impurity. Go ahead and live the life that you want. In today's world, today's theological term for that is hyper grace. Hyper grace means as long as you believe in Jesus, you can live life however you want to. New song, that is not the gospel. It's not the gospel. The gospel says when you trust in Christ alone, for salvation, you are made new. The old is gone. The new has come. God changes your want to. You don't want to, you don't want to live the, the life that you were living because that life and those sins separated you from God. You don't want to give your, yourself to that. But there are people who say, hey, listen, as long as you believe in Jesus, you can live life however you want to, hyper grace. The Bible says even the demons believe in Jesus and they're not saved, Right? Okay, so when you truly are surrendered to Christ, trusting in Christ alone, when you, when you confess your need for a Savior, the Bible says you're made do, and he changes your desires. He changes your want to. The other side of it is these, the, the teachings of the Nicolaitans, were, which were all about judgment and harshness, and you've got to be perfect in order to earn your way to heaven. And it was, it was, you better be right. You better be holy. You better be good. You better be righteous. We would call that in today's world, the opposite of hyper grace is hyper truth. And you say, well, well, pastor, truth is important. It certainly is. But can I be honest with you? We haven't even Jesus himself, John 3, 17, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. So if Jesus didn't have the ability to condemn everybody else around him, do you think you have that calling on your life? And what he's saying is stop judging, stop being critical, stop pointing out everybody else's faults. You need to be a people of truth. But, but don't be critical. Don't be prideful. Don't be high-minded like you're the only one who has it all together. See, hyper-grace, it's wrong. Hyper-truth, it's wrong. Jesus came full of grace and truth. Can I tell you the balance there? The, the balance is I've been saved by grace through faith. I've been changed. I've been made new. I'm all in. I'm surrendering my life to Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm sure I'm going to fail. I don't want to, but I'm sure I'm going to fail. And when I fail, grace is there for that. I am loved. I am secure in Christ Jesus. My eternity is settled in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to take the word. I'm going to live it out. I, I'm not going to make excuses for it. I'm going to embrace it and live it in my life. And when I make mistakes, I'm going to lean into grace. I'm going to lean into mercy. I'm going to lean into love. And when other people make mistakes, and they are, I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to build them up. I'm not going to put my finger in their face. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my arm around their shoulder and say, brother, let's go together. Let's, let's, get, let's get better together. Let's follow Jesus together. I got you. That's how we're supposed to live life, filled with grace 
and truth. Filled with grace and truth. You know, the Bible says, do you have brothers and sisters, people of the faith who are caught in sin? He says, go and rescue them. You go to them, not with your finger pointing at their nose. You go to them with your hand outstretched saying, come on, I got you. Let's go together. Let's move forward together. Come on, everybody. So hyper grace, hyper truth, right in the middle is the balance. People of grace, people of truth. And we have to operate in both all the time. To Thyatira is the fourth letter. And Jesus said this. He said, I want you to remove impurity from your life. Verse 20 says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet by her teaching. She misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. You know what he's saying? You're allowing people to influence you concerning things that are impure. And you need to repent of that. You need to stop it. Can I ask you a question? Who are you allowing to influence you concerning things that are impure? Can I, can I go even further? Some of you are being influenced by impurity, by a person or persons that you have never met and never will meet because they live in your television and they live in your phone and they live in your computer, they live in your podcasts, You'll never meet them, but you're being influenced by them to live an impure life. And you have to remove the impurity. You have to get rid of it. And you say, no more. I'm not being influenced like that. I'm not going to allow them influence on my life. That'll preach right there, everybody. See, I, I know this isn't, this, isn't, this isn't one of those topics where there's going to be a lot of jokes attached to it. But I've been called by God to prepare you for the timeline that's, gonna, that's, that's happening right now. You're part of the timeline. You're living the book of Revelation right now. Did you know that? You're in chapter two or chapter three. And I have to prepare you for chapters four through 22. And that's what I'm doing because I love you. I'm doing this for you. Number five, to the church at Sardis, renew your purpose. Renew your purpose. He says, verse two, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. He says, I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. You know, the best way I can relate this is, is a moment that I had with my dad before he passed away. He knew that he was getting ready to, to die. He knew that. It was just a few months before his death. And we had a missionary here that sun, Sunday called David Dingman. And it's very rare that we support so many missionaries here. It's very rare that I'll allow a missionary here on a Sunday morning. First of all, because our services are so tight. They're so back-to-back. I just don't have a lot of time to spare in a service. But, but because I love and appreciate Dave and his wife Amy so much, I, I said, hey, just take a couple minutes and share. And as he did on that Sunday morning, he, he, he used this, this three-word term, and he said, finish your yes. And I, I remember my dad after church, me and my dad and David talking, and, and my dad's crying. He said, he said, you spoke to me today, David. He said, you told me to finish my yes. And he said, I don't know what the Lord has got yet for me. I think I'm about to die but I will finish my yes. New song, you gotta renew your purpose. You were created on purpose for a purpose. You, at one point, if you're a Christian, at one point you said yes to God, meaning God, I'm all in. Just wherever you want me, wherever you want me to go, what you want me to say, what you want me to do, I'm just gonna do that for you. I'm gonna live a life of obedience to you. New song, finish your yes. Renew your purpose. Don't live your life to prove a point. Live your life to make a difference. That's how you live your life. Whew. Finish your yes. Isn't that good stuff? I'll always treasure that moment with my dad. Months before his passing, he knew he was going to die. And he said, but I still got something to do. I don't know what it is, 
but I'll do it when the Lord makes that opportunity. I'll be there. And boy, he was. To the church at Philadelphia. This is the only church that, that Jesus didn't correct, really. He actually just bragged on them. But he did say this, revere the word of God. You've got to revere, revere the word of God. Revelation 3.8, he said, I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. He said, he said you have kept my word. What does that tell us? We have to revere the word of God. Everybody, listen to your pastor, listen to your pastor. I am facing this now more than ever as a pastor. People have come to me, well, pastor, I'm a Christian. Well, do you believe the word of God? Yeah, I believe the word of God. Well, just not that. I believe the word of God, but I, I still want to do what I want to do. And I know the Bible says that I'm not supposed to be doing what I'm doing right now, but I just want to do it anyway. I just think God got it wrong in that, and I just want to go ahead and keep doing what I want to do. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Revere the word of God. That the word of God should trump everything in your life. When it comes to decision making, the word of God should trump your opinion every single time. Your opinion will not stand forever, but the word of God will. Your opinion will not endure forever, but the word of God will. Because it's true, and truth never changes. Don't live your life embracing sin when the Bible clearly spells out that it's a sin. Don't defend what the Bible says is wrong. And don't neglect what the Bible says is right. Come on, somebody. I, I, need, I need all of you mature Christians cheering me on right now because we're living in a generation that says, well, I'm, I believe in Jesus, I'm good. I can do whatever I want to do, hyper grace. And it scares me, because I think there are false current converts, and I've, I taught about that a couple of mon months ago, that I think some people have convinced themselves that they're Christians, and they're really not. They're really not. They believe in Jesus, but that doesn't mean they've trusted in Jesus. It doesn't mean they've surrendered their life to Jesus. And there's a difference. There's a difference. Number seven, this is the one that we most commonly hear about. It's the church at Laodicea. And I think we most commonly hear about it, or we most often hear about it because it's the most common issue in the church. And Jesus is saying, I want you to repent of lukewarmness. He said, I know your deeds, verse 15 of chapter three, I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, and I've acquired wealth, and I don't need a thing, but you don't realize that you're actually wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. He said, you have stuff, so you think you have it all. But you're poor, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're blind, you're naked, and you don't even realize it. And we have to repent of lukewarmness. So I'm teaching you how to prepare for the end times. And for those of you who the subject matter, you get kind of nervous about it and, and say, boy, pastor, I, I don't like to think those thoughts. Well, could it be? Could it be? It's because one of these letters are pointed towards you. In fact, I want you to do something as application here, and then I'll... I'll, I'll we're going to end on a really good news here, okay? We're going to end on really, really good news, but hang with me just for a second. Out of those seven things that we've talked about today, return to your first love, remain faithful, reject doctrinal extremes, remove impurity, renew your purpose, revere the word of God, repent of lukewarmness, one of those seven probably stood out to you. One of those seven, you probably said, that's me. That's me. And I want you to do something. I want you to circle it. I want you to mark it. I want you to point to it. I want you to write big words next to it. That's me. But in a second, we're going to scratch that out and say, it used to be me. 
Because of all the ways that the Bible ended, of all the ways that the book of Revelation ended, we, we move to chapter 22, the final chapter in the book of Revelation, and in verse 17, one of the final verses in that chapter, and watch what's said here. The spirit and the bride say, come. And to the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes Take the free gift of the water of life. Do, do, you know, do you know who's eligible for salvation? Anybody who wishes it, anybody who wants it, anybody that longs for it. He says, if you want it, you can have it. Just come, just come. Who's eligible for forgiveness in this room? You are. If you want to be forgiven, you're eligible. If you want to be forgiven for lukewarmness or for walking away from your first love, if you want to be forgiven for impurities that you've allowed in your life, if you want to be forgiven because you're not living out your purpose in Christ Jesus, if you want to be forgiven, you're eligible. The Bible just says, come. And we just confess our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us. So you can leave this place with joy in your heart and a spring in your step because you settled it right here, right now. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. I've presented this, I'm sure not very well, but to the very best of my ability. I put hours and hours and hours into this moment. And I'm gonna ask two questions. The first one is, have you, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? If you say, Pastor, I'm not a Christian, I've never, I've never trusted in Christ for salvation. You don't have to leave here today the same way you came in. If you just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a savior, would you save me? He always says yes. Whoever wishes can take this free gift. I'm wondering, I'm not gonna embarrass you or call you out, but with every head bowed, every eye closed, can I just ask you a question? Again, I'm not gonna embarrass you or call you out in any way. But if you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, would you just hold up your hand really high and just say, Pastor, it's me. Okay, I see your hands. I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. You can put your hands down. Multiple people, at least eight or nine people. And I'm gonna pray a prayer, but just stay right where you are because we got something else to confront here in a second. And if you raise your hand right there, it's just a prayer that goes something like this. You can word it however you want to. Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And I realize I can't save myself. I'm, I just can't do it. I don't know how. But according to your word, I'm not called to save myself. I'm called to trust in you, to confess my sins to you, to, to confess that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Because I, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that you are the savior of the world. I, I believe in the cross, I believe in the resurrection. Jesus, I believe in you. That today, in this day, I confess you as Lord. And I surrender my life to you. I trust you wholeheartedly with my life. So wash me clean of all of my sins. Purify me from all unrighteousness. Lord, wash it away and make me new and help me to live my life, surrender to you all of my days to the best of my ability. What I'm saying, Jesus, is I'm all in. I'm surrendering to you. But I'm gonna need you, and I'm, no, I'm gonna need your spirit at work within me to help me live the life that I, that I want to live, a new life in Christ. I need you. So Lord, would you be with me? Would you teach me your word? Would you help me to grow in my faith and in my walk with you as I follow you all of my days? Thank you for being gracious to me. I love you. And today I make you my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Now with every head still bowed, let me ask another question. If one of those seven stood out to you and you said, you know what, Pastor, this is me, 
Mine was number three. Mine was number four. Maybe you had three or four that you say, boy, I was several of those. And you want to make it right. Right now, you want to give that to God and repent of it. Would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Okay. Yeah, lots of hands. It's been like this all morning. Heavenly Father, once again, I surrender myself to you too. I have done things and said things and thought things that I shouldn't have. But today I'm returning to my first love. And I'm asking you to help me to remain faithful. I'm rejecting doctrinal extremes. And I'm asking you to remove every impurity in my life and renew my purpose. I choose to honor your word as being true and I will embrace it all of my days. Today I repent of lukewarmness. Today I'm all in. I'm all in. And I'm not going back to the way it used to be. I'm all in. But like we've already prayed, I need your help. I need your spirit in my life. So help me to live the life you've called me to as I live for the glory of your name as I live a life of surrender. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen.